Hey, we are in week two of a series that we started last week entitled Social Theology. Social Theology. And last week as we kind of launched into this series, we just simply said that theology is our thoughts about God. It's what we think about when we think about God. And I gave you this quote last week. It was from A.W. Tozer. It's kind of a launching pad. It says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And I really believe that to be true, that what we think about, what comes to our minds when we think about who God is and what he's capable of doing in our life, it's really the most important thing about us because it shapes everything else that we, that we do in life. And so if you're here last week, we said that we need to develop some good theology. We need to develop the correct thoughts about who God is. And we started to talk about what does truth look like, that truth is not relative, that truth is absolute, and that truth is a person and his name is Jesus Christ. And so if we want to know truth, we have to know Jesus. And in knowing Jesus, we find freedom and we find freedom in Christ. And that that knowing Christ and his word in our life, it's foundational for our life because it's been revealed to us throughout the scripture. And so today I want to kind of jump on in and just continue to go on this kind of thoughts that we're having is that we need to understand that our theology is going to determine the decisions that we make. And so if we're not careful, we are going to allow the, the theology of this world or the theology that we pick up through social media or the theology we pick up through relationships that we have with people or the theology that we pick up through the media that's out there, if we're not careful, we're going to allow all of these other places to influence the thoughts that we have about God instead of the Word of God. And so we have to be careful. We have to make sure that we have a sound theology. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 through 4, uh, Paul would write this to, to Timothy. He would say these words, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. And how many know this is kind of the world we live in right now, right? Like a time is coming where people will not put up with sound, you could say sound theology or the correct thoughts about God. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They'll they'll gather around them a great number of people, teachers, influencers around them that will only say the things that they want to, to hear, the things that they want them to say, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Like, I I don't know about you, but when I read that, like, I mean, we just see that Paul is prophesying what we're living out in our world today. That so many people are are turning away and won't put up with sound doctrine, sound theology. Instead, they're just looking for people that will agree with them, that will build up their stance, build up their thoughts, and neglect the thoughts and the word of God and the thoughts about who God is in our life. And they says the Bible says that they'll turn aside and they'll begin to believe myths myths in their life and they'll turn from truth to myth. And that if we're not going to do this, then we have to make sure that we're grounded in truth. And being grounded in the truth only comes when we are grounded in the word of God because it is a firm foundation for our life. So the question I have for you this morning is can we look at this next part of social theology and like our thoughts and how our thoughts drive our theology, our thoughts about God drives our lives. Let me ask you, have you ever had something in your life that you found was valuable or something in your life that was worth protecting? Like, I'm sure if you think about it, all of us have had something in our life that's worth protecting. Some of you have safes in your home because you put what is valuable to you in that safe or you put it into that lockbox. I can remember being a child. And when I was a, a teenager and as a, as, a, as a younger child, I remember collecting baseball cards. Any baseball card collectors in the house, right? Like, I mean, I thought when I was a child and I would collect baseball cards, like, I thought they were going to have a lot of value to them, Right? And I, and I had a thing and I could look up the price of these cards. And when I would get what I thought was a valuable card, I would put it in a protective sleeve. I would make sure nobody else could touch it. I would put it in a place to make sure that I never lost it. Because in my young age, in my view of that card was that that card was valuable. I didn't want anybody to steal it. I didn't want anybody to be around it. I didn't want anybody to bend the card or to mess up the corners because I thought that that card had value. And when something has value, it is worth protecting. It's worth taking care of. And the Bible tells us 
that all of us have something valuable in our life. And what the Bible tells us is this, is that the valuable thing that every single one of us possesses is our, it's a heart. The book of Proverbs would say it this way, above all else, in Proverbs 4, verse 3, above all else. Now, how many of you know when you see this statement, above all else, that we should probably pause and realize that this is going to be a powerful statement? And that what he says next is so crucial for our lives. Above all else, he says, guard your, guard your heart. Like there's a lot of things that the writer of Proverbs could have said in this moment. They could have said, above all else, make sure that you pray every day. Above all else, you should always read your Bible. Above all else, you should go to church. And all of those things are important. All of those things have some value to it. But they said the most valuable thing that you and I possess in our life is our heart. And so above all else, you need to guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And so all throughout the Bible, the Bible connects our hearts and our mind together. The Bible would also go on and say, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so our heart is the seat of emotion. Our heart is the place that is the seat of intellect. It's the the Bible ties these two things together, our, our emotions and our intellect. And it says that our heart is the place that everything else flows from. And so according to the Bible, when you fly off the hook in anger and you lash out in anger, it wasn't just because somebody cut you off on the road. No, the Bible would say it's, that's not the reason that you lashed out in anger. The Bible would say the reason that you lashed out in anger is because it came from somewhere on the inside of you. And it wasn't just caused by an incident. It was on the inside of you. The Bible would say the reason that you cussed someone out is not because you made a mistake and a word slipped out of your mouth. The Bible would tell us that those words come from somewhere. The reason that you look at something that you shouldn't be looking at isn't because you accidentally scrolled and landed on something on your phone or on your computer. No, the Bible would tell us that it comes from somewhere and the place that it comes from is our hearts. And that there's this spiritual connection between my heart, my mindset, and my thinking. And so what we have to understand is this, is that my thinking drives my living. What I think is going to drive my living. And so our theology is our thoughts about God. And so what I think about God is going to drive how I choose to live my life. And so the choices that we make and the things that we do in life are results of the thoughts that we have. It's the results of our thinking. I mean, for instance, if you, and as you were growing up, If you ever put your hand as a young child, like on a hot stove, when you touch that stove, all of a sudden you had a thought that said, guess what? This stove is what? It's hot. And you put your hand on it and all of a sudden your mind, your thinking tells you, guess what? I don't want to do that again. And now because you've had this thought, now all of a sudden it's driving your actions and you no longer put your hand on that stove. When I was a child, I got burnt by my mom's curling iron and it landed on my hand. Guess what I learned? I learned that curling irons are bad. And it drove my actions to the place where I didn't want to be anywhere close to a curling iron because I understood something about it. The thought I had drove my action that guess what? I'm never going to touch that again. I'm never going to allow that to land on my hand just as a stove would do. You see, for some of us, The burn that we got was a stab in the back from a friend. And now your thinking is, I can't trust anyone. And it affects all of the other relationships in your life. Why? Because my thinking drives the way that I live my life. And because my thinking drives the way that I live my life, that's why the Bible says, above all else, guard your heart. Because out of it flows everything else in your life. Luke 6 verse 45 would say it this way to us. A good person produces good things from the treasury. And I love this word here. The Bible paints this picture that a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. 
or the, the savings accounts, the treasury, the savings account of your heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury or the savings account of an evil heart. And what you say flows from what's in your, what's in your heart. Another version would say, out of the overflow of the heart, the heart, the mouth speaks. Maybe some of you are like, well, Aaron, I'm not an evil person. Like, like, like I, that, that doesn't describe me. Like, I just must have good things in my life because I'm not an evil person. But can I tell you something? We all have a tendency towards evil. Like, you, if you hold bitterness in your heart, guess what that is? That's evil. If you hold unforgiveness in your heart, guess what that is? That, that's, that's evil. If we hold anger in our heart, guess what? That, that's evil. Well, Aaron, I, like I'm not, some of you are like, Aaron, I'm not evil. Like I, I've never murdered anybody. I've never thought these bad thoughts. I've never done these types of things. I'm not an evil person. No, but guess what? If you have pride in your heart, guess what that is? That, that's evil. And there's a part of our hearts that has a savings account of evil that, that we can store up these evil things and then out of that comes these evil actions. We could say it this way. We all have some savings accounts of good and evil. And what comes out of our heart is a direct reflection of what we're storing up in it. It's, what, it's a direct reflection of what we're putting into the savings accounts of our life. And from the deposits you make in your hearts, that's what comes out of your hearts. And the problem is this, is we receive deposits from so many different places. We receive deposits from all of these different places and the deposits that we receive are affecting our thoughts and therefore it's driving the way that I'm living my life. And sometimes when we respond to people, we respond and we'll say things like this, well, that, that, that caused a trigger in me. That triggered me. The Bible says that's no, there's no such thing as a trigger. No, it's the treasury of your hearts. It's, it's what's already been on the inside of you. And for some, the deposits that you have, have in your life are the words that have been spoken over your life by someone else. Like someone else has said something over your life and those have been deposited in you and now out of the treasury of your heart, that's how you deal with relationships because of what's been spoken over you. Out of the treasury of your heart, that's how you deal with parenting situations. Out of the treasury of your heart, that's how you, that's the way that's, that's why you treat your spouse the way you do because of what's been deposited on the inside of you. It's the reason you respond to coworkers the way you do. It's the reason you respond to your boss the way that you do because something's been spoken over you, something's been deposited in you, and now the deposit is coming forth in your life, and out of the treasury of your heart, you respond to those that are around you. And yet some of us are, the deposit have been because of what's been spoken over us, but some of us, the deposits we're making is because of the things that we're consuming through our scroll, through the feed on social media, through, through the things that we're consuming and the culture that is around us and that we are allowing the content of so many voices to speak into our life and to make deposits into the treasury of our hearts. And because of what we're viewing, because of what we're scrolling, because of our, our news feeds and our social media feeds, we are digesting bitterness and we're digesting insecurity and we're digesting fear and we're digesting anger because of what we read online. And maybe some of you are like, oh, I don't digest anger for when I read online. I bet you. How many of you ever been like, have you seen this post? I can't believe they posted that. I can't believe they said that about me. And you're like DMing somebody and taking screenshots and you're sending it off. Why? Because you are allowing that to, to deposit something on the inside of you. And now that's going to be the thing that comes out of you. Let's get out of the social world for a minute. I hope you see the big picture of this series. It's not even just that. Some of you, you're allowing your news apps to deposit things on the inside of you. And you're allowing these voices to, to deposit something into the treasury of your heart that's creating bitterness and hate. 
Some of you are allowing friendships in your life to deposit things into the treasury of your heart. And guess what? They're not good things, but they're evil things that are getting deposited on the inside of you. And we have to understand that whatever is deposited into the treasury of my heart is the thing that's going to come out of my life. And here's the problem. Is that oftentimes, as Christians or in the Christian world, we think outputs and not inputs. That so often we think behavior modification is what we need in our life so that there's good outputs. Like if I act better, if I'm just a little nicer to people, if I, if I just stop looking at this, if I just try harder, like, like I can overcome this struggle in my life and then the output will be good. Can I remind you, this was the very issue that Jesus got onto the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He looked at him, he says, guess what? You try to clean the outside of the cup. But the truth is, is there something internally that has to be changed in order for the outside of the cup to be clean? You see, the output is not the issue. The input is the issue. And what we put into our life is what is producing the output of our life. And for some of you, the best thing that you can do for your heart is get to a place in your life where you start unfollowing some things. Where you decide that, guess what? I'm not going to allow these voices. I'm not going to allow this content to be the thing that is depositing things into the treasury of my heart. And therefore, I'm going to unfollow. I'm going to Stop allowing these things to be the voice in my life. So if you're taking notes, I want to give you five things this morning that I think all of us should unfollow. So the first is this. If your feed is feeding you negativity, it's time to unfollow. If your feed is feeding you negativity, it's time to unfollow. If your feed is creating a treasure of negativity in your heart, it's time to decide that, guess what? I'm not going to allow the negative thoughts and the voices in my life to deposit things in my heart. Here's what it says in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 15, verse 4. It would say this, a soothing tongue. And I don't think I got this up on the screen. Let me read this to you. A soothing tongue. And this is the amplified version. It says, speaking words that build up and encourage, that's what a soothing tongue is, it's words that build up and encourage, is a tree of life. And so if you scroll, and you're on your social media, and you feel less alive, can I tell you something? It's time to unfollow some things. Because if you go to social media, and, it, and it's not encouraging you, it's not bringing life, then guess what? It's not healthy for you. Because it also goes on and says that a perversive tongue or speaking words that overwhelm and depress crushes the spirit. Like how many of you have you ever scrolled and you feel more down and you feel more like the life is sucked out of you than when you started? Like, like that's just the nature oftentimes of social media. You start scrolling through things and you're like, I can't believe they're doing that. I, like, I can't believe they said this about me. I can't believe they talked about this person. I can't believe they went to these places. And guess what? The Bible says that that is something that crushes our spirit. It, it depresses us. It's a perversive tongue. And for some of you, the source of anxiety in your life is the very things that you are following in your life. And you're allowing the deposit of negativity to get into you. And maybe you're sitting here and you're like, well, Aaron, it's not affecting me. Really? Like it is affecting your life. You become negative about everything around you and the way that you see people and the things that are happening. And so if your feed is feeding you negativity, guess what it's going to get into you? If you're feeding you negativity, what's going to get into you is negativity. And when negativity gets in you, guess what? It's going to come out of you. That's the very thing that your life is going to produce. You're going to produce a negative spirit. And I can tell you this, people don't like to be around negative people. I don't. I don't like to be around people who's, who's allowed the treasury of negativity to be planted in their heart. And then they allow that to overflow into every situation that's around them. Ephesians 4 verse 29 says this. 
Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And so if that's what I'm supposed to be doing, and what I put in is what comes out, then according to this scripture, what I need to be putting into my life is wholesome talk. I have to put into my life and let what comes out of my life be those things that are helpful and beneficial to those that are around me. I don't need the negative feed. I don't need the negative mindset. And can I just remind some of you, just because you think something doesn't mean you need to say it. Right? Just because you think it doesn't mean that it's actually helpful and beneficial to those that are around you just because someone else thinks something doesn't mean that you need to receive it and digest it in your life why because what they say is not helpful or beneficial in building you up and I hope you're getting the bigger metaphor today like this isn't just about Facebook it's not just about social media but what voices are coming into your life that are negative in your life what are you surrounding yourself with Because the voices that you are allowing to deposit into the treasury of your heart will come out in your life. And so if your feed is feeding you negativity, it's time to unfollow. The second thing you can write down is this, is if your feed is feeding you temptation, it's time to unfollow. Now, I'm not just talking about the type of temptation that that maybe you see through media and social media, the, the temptation to look at pornography or to engage in that. But what about if your feed is feeding you the temptation to go back to an old way of thinking? What if your feed is is feeding you the temptation to give up on the dreams that God has placed inside of you? What if the feed is pushing you back to an old group of friends, an old way of life, old habits that you've engaged in before? Like if your feed is feeding you temptation, it's time to unfollow. James 1, verse 13 through 17 says it this way. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Like this is where temptation comes from. It comes from our own evil desires and when we are enticed by those things. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown gives birth to death. He goes on and says this, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. And so James is trying to tell us that God isn't the one that's tempting you. But we are led away in our life by our own desires. The things that we so desire in our life. And so if our feed is feeding you temptation, it's feeding into the desires that you have in your life. Guess what? It's time to unfollow. Paul would go on to tell us this in the scripture. He would say that we all have a sin that easily gets us. So he would use the word so easily entangles us. And so there's these things in our life and it may look different for every single one of us. And so we have to know what is it that entices us? What is it that pulls us away from the things that God has for us? And if there's temptation in our life, how do we move away from it? For some of us, the things that easily entangles us may be pride. And guess what? Pride is one of the greatest sins that is often found in the body of Christ. And it's one of those things that goes sometimes so undetected in people's lives. But it is so easy to allow pride, the pride of life, the pride of who you are and what you've accomplished to come to the service. And guess what? That's a temptation in your life. And you need to get away from it. For some, it's lust. For others, it's arrogance. For some, the sin that easily entangles you may be the pursuit of wealth in your life. Or maybe there's something else, but guess what? There's something that entices you, that pulls you away from the thing that God has for you. 
And so the Bible says that we are tempted when we are led away by our own desires. What are the desires that are on the inside of you? And if there's a temptation that your feed is feeding you, then the wise thing to do in your life is going to be to cut out that temptation so that you don't give in to it. And oftentimes when it comes to temptation, we often ask the question, well, how close can I get without going over? Like how close can I get to the line and still be okay? And the real question we need to ask is this, is what do I have to do to cut it away so that temptation isn't the thing that leads me away, that leads me down a path? So for example, maybe your temptation is to build wealth in your life. Now there's nothing wrong with with, with having wealth, but can I tell you something? If building wealth is your end all be all, then guess what? It is a temptation that is enticing you away from the fullness of life that God has for you. And so if you find yourself following things about how to get rich quick, how how to make a lot of money, and that's what you're being consumed with, if that is feeding something in you that is unhealthy, then you need to get as far away from it as you can because Paul says, guess what? You are being enticed by your own evil desire. And so you gotta put some boundaries around it. You got to decide that guess what? I'm going to set up some boundaries in my life so that I don't give into the snare. I don't give into the temptation that is in front of me. I'm not going to give into the very thing that is trying to entice me away from the things that God has for me. And so I'm not going to allow temptation in. And some of you were allowing temptation in because of the feeds that we have the things that we scroll through, the people that we're around, we are getting close to the line and it's the very thing that the enemy will use to entice you away. And so I can't allow these things in my life. I gotta have some boundaries. Why? Because you gotta declare and and understand that God's trying to take you somewhere. That God has purpose for your life. Like, I'm not good. God doesn't want you. Don't allow anything to become a lid to the destiny that God has for your life. And guess what temptation becomes? It becomes a lid to the, des- to the, 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 the destiny that God has over you. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17 says this. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so anything that is creating bondage in your life is not of God. It's not of God. Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. So if you look over your life and you say, you know what, I'm in bondage to this. This is an area of my life that I don't have freedom. Then that's something that's not of God because where the spirit of the Lord dwells, there's going to be freedom in your life. And can I just tell you sometimes? It's sometimes the very thing that's causing bondage in your life. It may not be a sin, but it also may not be wise for you to participate in. It may not be sin, but it may not be wise. And that's part of what our goal is as followers of Jesus Christ is what? I told you last week, it's to grow into a place of maturity. In Ephesians 4, it says we need to grow into maturity just as Christ is the head of the church. And so maturity in our life gets to a place where it says, you know what? This may not be wrong, but it may not be best. It may not be wrong, but it may not be beneficial for my life. And so if your feed is feeding you temptation, you need to unfollow. The third thing is this. If your feed is feeding you fear, it's time to unfollow. See, some of us are so gripped by fear because of all the content that you are digesting, because of all the things that you are allowing into the treasury of your heart. And you find yourself gripped by fear. Gripped by the fear of what could happen. That you are gripped so much by fear that every time that you're dealt with a situation, you go to the worst case scenario. You just, you just, you just are like, well, this is it. The world's falling apart. Everything, and everything's bad. And you live from a place of fear. Like every ache you have, you're dying. Every time, yeah, everything that your kids want to do, you're, you're fearful of it. And you live from this place that, that becomes crippling in your life. And the things that your, your feed is feeding you, the things that you're scrolling through, is just 
you're just affirming the assumptions that you already have and you're being driven by fear. But 2 Timothy 1.7 tells us this, for the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Another version would say he gives us a sound mind. It's a power, love, and a sound mind. And so the Bible is teaching us that the thoughts of fear that we often have, the thoughts of fear that we have in our life are the opposite of a sound mind or sound judgment. And so fear is simply irrational thinking. It's irrational thinking. And so I'm not talking about the type of fear that is the instinct that God gives us that says, you know what, don't walk down a dark alley at night, right? That's a healthy fear. That's a good fear. But I'm talking about the type of fear that keeps us from moving towards the destiny that God has for us. The type of fear that is irrational thinking because the Bible says that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us the opposite. He's given us power, love, and sound judgment, sound thinking in our life. It's right thinking. And when we have right thinking, guess what? That's going to drive our life in the right direction. It's clarity of thoughts. And for some of us, your thoughts are so clogged by the content that you're ingesting that we don't have sound judgment in our thinking and we're gripped by fear. And it causes us to not take the steps that God is calling us into or pursue the dreams that, that God has put in our hearts. And the purpose that God has for you, it becomes capped and limited because of the fear that has gripped your life, because of the fear that's been deposited on the inside of you. And your destiny is too great for your thinking to be small and fear-driven. Because he's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Like Jesus is alive, the tomb is empty, the king is on the throne, and therefore I have power, love, and a sound mind that fear must go, it must get out of our hearts, it must get out of our lives because Jesus is alive. And so if your feed is feeding you fear, guess what, you need to be de de begin to declare, guess what, I don't have to live in fear. I have power, love, and a sound mind. And the reason that the, I can have a sound mind is because I have the perfect love of my heavenly father. Amen. Amen. Give Jesus Christ an ovation of praise. That's what 1 John 4, 18 tells us. Look at this. It says this. It says this to us. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. It's gone because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. There is no fear because perfect love, the perfect love of my heavenly father drives it out. And so I'm not saying you won't face fear, but I'm saying what you'll do is you'll move forward in the face of fear because I have the perfect love of the Father. The fourth thing is this, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. If your feed is feeding you disconnection, it's time to unfollow. Let me explain this to you. You see, often our feeds show us a reality that's not real, and therefore it disconnects us from reality. Our feeds show us a reality that's not real and that disconnects us from reality. And when you are disconnected from reality, it becomes really easy to make broad brush statements about groups of people. And you begin to just look at groups of people and you're like, all these people are this way. You begin to look at everybody that's homeless. All homeless people are drug addicts. You begin to look at people that are this or that and the, you just assume all of them are the same way and here's what happens is you become so desensitized by the scroll that you get apathetic. You get apathetic to the brokenness of humanity and you begin to lose empathy for people. And can I tell you something? We can't get to the place where we allow there to be a disconnection and an apathetic spirit that falls over us. And Revelations, can I tell you what the Bible says there? He says there, he says, I wish you were either hot or cold. But you know what he would say there? Is because you're just kind of eh, because you're just apathetic, he says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. 
Can I tell you something? Sometimes our feed is feeding us a disconnection where we become so apathetic at the brokenness of the humanity of all around us. And you see someone's brokenness and it no longer moves you. You see the problems in our world and it no longer breaks your hearts. And we begin to categorize people and we begin to marginalize people and we don't stop and remember that people are made in the image of God. Proverbs 18.1 says this, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgments. A person who isolates themselves, who disconnects themselves, seeks his own desires. His own desires. 1 Peter 3 verse 8, finally all of you should be of one mind sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. Sympathize. Understand. Don't lose the connection. If you are no longer broken over the brokenness of humanity, you have disconnected. And it's time to unfollow some things in your life because we can't become disconnected. The final and fifth thing is this. If your feed is feeding you comparison, it's time to unfollow. If you can't be happy with the life that you have because of the comparison that you're making to everyone else's life, it's time to unfollow some things because that's getting deposited into the treasury of your hearts. If you can't be happy on your vacation, then can I tell you something? You need to get some of this media out of you because it's the voice that's consuming you. Because comparison will rob you of joy. It always does. And the reason some of you have no joy in your life is because you're scrolling so much and when you scroll, all you see is what everyone else is looking at. All you see is everything that everybody else is consuming and you're looking at everyone else and you're comparing your life to their highlight reels and you begin to say, well, my life doesn't live up and therefore I must not have the things that I need to have and therefore God hasn't blessed me and all of a sudden it robs you of joy. James 3, verse 14 through 16 says this. It says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. It says, where you have envy, you'll find disorder. Maybe some of you are like, well, Aaron, I don't have envy. I don't envy things. Well, that's what comparison is. Comparison is looking at what somebody else has and wanting what they have, and that is envy. And the Bible says wherever envy is present, where comparison is present, guess what? You're gonna find some disorder in your life because it will rob you from joy and it will steal your peace. And the Bible says that envy is this, what is envy, comparison? It is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Like it comes from the devil and it will cause disorder in your life. Comparison and envy will cause you to buy things just because you saw someone else buy it. It will cause you to go into debt to keep up with someone else's choices, someone else's life. And guess what? When you do those things, there's going to be some disorder in your life because comparison is the killer of contentment. And so if your feed is feeding you comparison, you need to unfollow. The psalmist said it this way in Psalms. He would say these words to us. He would say, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. The psalmist David learned that guess what? The boundary lines that God had placed around his life, those were pleasant in his life. Those were good for his life. David begins to say, guess what? I'm happy in the portion that God has given me. I'm content in the boundary lines that God has placed around me. I'm content where God has put my feet. I'm content in the family that God has place me and I'm content in the job that he's given me because these are the boundary lines that are around my life and guess what when you have some boundary lines when you have some contentment in your life that will give you peace and so if your feet is feeding you comparison it's time to unfollow as Jason gets ready to come to the keyboard let me just give you some practical steps 
real quickly. So how do you guard your hearts? How do we do this? And I'm out of time, and I know that, but give me a few more minutes. Romans 12, 1 through 2, it says this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind you will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you, the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Amen. So let God's word transform the way that you think about things. I'm going to let God's word transform the way I think. Because the way I think is going to drive how I, what I live. And so just because everyone else is thinking something doesn't mean I have to think it. Just because it's popular doesn't mean it's good, wise, or even healthy for you. And so I'm going to allow God's word to transform my thinking. See, neuroscientists have found that you have neural pathways in your brain that allows you to respond to things without even thinking, right? Like there's things that have been so ingrained in your mind that you no longer have to think about it. You just respond to those things. That's how God designed us. That's how God created us. And then Paul would come back and he says, guess what? You can change these neural pathways the way that you think so that you are always responding in the correct way. So God can reroute your thinking. He can change, the one who created you can change the neural pathways in your mind so that all of a sudden you respond without thinking, but you're responding the way that God wants you to respond. And so all of a sudden, negativity comes into your life and you don't respond in anger. You respond with grace because that's what God can do in us. Like, what was the way that I used to think, the way that I used to respond, what used to come out of my life? No, my thinking has been changed. The, the treasury of my heart has been stored up in good things. And now when I have a moment, guess what? I'm not responding in anger. I'm responding in grace because there's been a change on the inside of me. This is what the Spirit of God does for us. It transforms you. But in order to get to this place of transformation, there's going to be some things in your life that you have to unfollow so that you can start following the Word of God. Because there's these opposite truths at work in your life. And you have to decide that, guess what? I'm going to live my life for the higher truth. I'm going to live my life for the Word of God. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 verse 5, Paul would say it this way. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down strongholds of human reasoning and destroy false arguments. This word stronghold can be interpreted this, this way, the house of wrong thinking. Like there are strongholds in your life and guess what they are? They're the house of wrong thinking. Like you're thinking incorrectly. And so you have to choose instead of believing the lie and allowing it to produce something in your life. Paul says, no, 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 don't do that. Don't just grab a hold of these things and believe that. He says, guess what we need to do? We need to wage war against the strongholds in our life. Another translation would say that we need to tear down strongholds. Can I tell you something? This isn't just like a little like, oh, who cares? I got some strongholds in my life. This is aggressive words. Paul's like, you need to get serious about this. There's some thinking in you. There's some strongholds in your life. And you need to go, begin to tear those things down so that they don't take root in your life. And then he would go on and say, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture the, the rebellious thoughts and teach them, what? To obey Christ. And so this is what Paul was telling us in Romans 12 too. He says, you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so what am I doing? I'm going to choose, and you're going to have to choose to tear down strongholds in your life. 
wrong ways of thinking. And I want to encourage you like Paul would, you need to get aggressive about it. You need to not just go, oh, it's just the way it is. No, no, no. I'm going to tear them down and I'm going to teach my mind. I'm going to transform this mind, the neural pathways in my mind. I'm going to let them be transformed by God so that all of a sudden I respond differently. I think differently because what I think is going to drive the, how I live my life. Amen. So I'm going to tear down strongholds. And can I be honest with you? You know what the strongholds are in your life. Well, Aaron, I just don't know what the strongholds No, no, you know what they are. For some of you, it may be strongholds of negativity. And guess what you need to do with that? You need to tear them down. For some, it may be fear. And you need to tear it down. You know what the temptation is. You know what is the nature of who you are that entices you away from God. And you need to tear that down. For some of you, maybe it's disconnection. And you need to decide, you know what, this is becoming a stronghold in my life. Like, I'm not broken over humanity like I used to be. And I'm going to tear that down. It's comparison. Like, there's envy in you. And there's all kinds of disorder in your life because you've allowed comparison to become the way that you think about things. And it's a stronghold in your life. And Paul says, guess what? I need to tear those down. And I need to teach them to obey Christ. Tearing them down. By, by like trying not to think about them anymore? No, no, no. Tearing them down by replacing them with the word of God. Declaring there's a higher truth in my life. Like I, whatever else has been spoken over me, whatever else has been deposited in my life, I'm going to align it with the truth of who God is. And I'm going to allow the truth of God, the word of God, the word of the living God to tear down strongholds in my life so that I can be free in everything that I do. And here's the benefit. Psalms 1, verse 1 through 3. Oh, the joys, David would say, of those who do not follow advice of the wicked. Or stand around and scroll with sinners. It doesn't say that, but maybe that's some of it. Stand around with sinners. Or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord. Meditating on it day and night. Amen. Meditate on it. This word meditate has this idea, it's this picture of a cow actually. And I don't know if you know anything about cows, but cows' stomachs have four compartments. And it's kind of disgusting, but when they eat grass, they, they digest it, they regurgitate it, they chew on it some more, and then guess what happens? They digest it. Again, that's what this word means. Like you're gonna meditate on it. Like I don't just read the scripture and move on. No, I digest it. I, I bring it back to my thoughts. I chew on it again a little bit more and then I digest it again. I'm going to allow it to saturate my heart and my mind and my spirit. And so I have to begin to meditate on the word of God. I have to begin to declare, well, God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Man, God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Man, he hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And what am I doing? I'm reprogramming the neural pathways. I'm reprogramming the way that I think. I'm tearing down this stronghold of fear in my life so that I can live in the freedom that Christ has for me. I'm meditating on it. And it will take discipline to do this. It will take a, a, a desire to say, God, I want these things for my life. Amen. But look at the benefits of it. Look at what the psalmist says is the benefits of it. He goes on in verse 3 and he would say this. They are like trees planted along the riverbanks, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never, never, never wither and they prosper in all that they do. Why do they prosper in all that they do when they meditate on the law of the Lord? Because what they're doing is driven by what they are thinking. And when their thinking and heart is so saturated by the word of God, they live their life out according to God's word and therefore they never have a dry season is what the Bible says. Look, they bear fruit in each season. There's no dry season. And they prosper in all that they do. So my question for you is this, is what, what is your feed feeding you? What are the voices in your life feeding you? Because what you think is driving how you live. And if it's feeding you fear, if it's feeding you negativity, if it's feeding you temptation, if it's feeding you disconnection, if it's feeding you comparison, guess what? You need to get rid of it. 
You need, you need to stop it. You need to disconnect from it. You need to unfollow those things so they can give birth to everything that Christ has for you. So it's not just social media, it's all of your life. For some of you, it is social media. Like do a little exercise. Go on your phone, hit your apps and see how long you spend on social media this every day. And can I be honest with you? If you probably look at it, you might be surprised. I was looking at mine this last week. I was like, whoo, I need to do something about that. I need to limit the intake from this area of my life because it's going to control the way that I think. Can I say, I see all these things in my own life at times. I can see how social media can make us compare. I can see how it can drive us to fear about the things that are going on in the world. I see it. I see how it brings negativity because of what other people post and what other people say. And so if it's feed, it's feeding is something we need to unfollow. And it's time to unfollow some things and let the word of God be what you meditate on day and night. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning?